Thank you for listening to Crossroads Community Church. At Crossroads, our mission is to be the church by exalting the glory of God, sharing and showing the love of Christ, and inviting others to be recipients of Christ's love. Now here's this week's message. We are um, closing down uh, a series that we started uh, called The Spirit-Filled Life. And before I even continue, because it's staring me in the face, I have to say, I love that shirt. That's awesome. (laughs) Anyway, sorry, I get sidetracked easily. Um, So we started the series talking about the fact that it's scientifically possible, according to scientific research. uh, um, In my conversations with a, a psychiatric nurse, she was telling me the research that she did that said it's scientifically possible Uh, for us to have the mind of Christ. In other words, for us to renew our minds because of the research they've done on how the brain patterns work, uh, that we can have the mind of Christ, uh, scientifically possible. Um, And the fact that if we have and renew our minds and transform our minds so that we have the mind of Christ, then it makes it easier uh, for us to have our bodies respond to things in a God-like way once God puts his spirit in us. So when someone crosses the line of faith and they become a believer in Jesus Christ, uh, God puts the promised holy seal or the seal of the Holy Spirit on us. We are filled with God's Holy Spirit. And then it makes it easier for our minds to react in a God-honoring way to tell our bodies, do the things that God wants us to do rather than the things that we'd rather do in the flesh. Uh, With God's spirit able to renew our minds, our bodies act in accordance with God's will rather than the way that our bodies normally want to act. Now, here's here's the thing. For the last couple of weeks, we've been kind of um, talking about the fruit of the Spirit because that's the growth, the way that our bodies want to react. The Spirit, once God puts His Spirit in us, um, we want to react in a way that is more God-honoring. God doesn't put his spirit in us. We act normally the way our spirits react, our normal human nature, which is sometimes not that good. And this is what Paul says when he's talking about, you know, that type of thing. He says when he writes to the church in Galatians in chapter 5, and I'm putting all the verses up on the screen because we're going to jump through a lot of verses. He says, but I say, walk and live habitually in the Holy Spirit, responsive to and controlled by the Spirit. So then you won't gratify the cravings and desires of the flesh. That's what this whole series has been about. How do we walk habitually and live in the Spirit? And then we talked about the fact that one of the ways we do that is by allowing the fruit of the Spirit to grow and be manifested in us. And the more we do that, then we're not satisfying what he says, the cravings and desires of the flesh. Right? Now, the desires of the flesh... Um, he lists out, and I'm about to put this in the complete Jewish Bible version for this, and I'll tell you why in a minute. And he says, it is perfectly evident what the old nature does, our old spirit, human spirit, right? It expresses itself in sexual immorality, impurity, and indecency. And one of the reasons it does that is because we're human, it's natural, we want pleasure. A lot of the, these things that he's going to list give us pleasure. Now, Here's the problem. He says that it is perfectly evident what the old nature does. But a lot of people will say, well, I'm not like that. I'm a good person. I do good things. But left to our own devices, and I go back to, what's that movie? I know it was a book first, but I don't read books. I watch movies. Um, The Lord of the Flies with the little children. They're on an island, and they kind of go wild, and they go all, like, barbarian on one another. And these are kids, so imagine what adults do. And in every apocalyptic movie you've ever seen, or I've ever seen, because I probably watch way more than you guys, the society goes bad. They don't end up being these angelic, perfect human beings, you know, once, like, the government's gone or there's a nuclear fallout. They end up being these primal, brutal type people. And then he goes on and he describes it in more detail. He says they have involvement with the occult and with drugs. And in most of your Bibles, instead of with the occult and drugs, it says like either witchcraft or sorcery. And the reason the complete Jewish Bible, and I've said this before, the reason why it says with the occult and with drugs is because sorcery and witchcraft, the words that's used in the Greek, 
for sorcery that some translate witchcraft is a word that means trying to reach a higher spiritual plane or supernatural plane by either ingesting or inhaling drugs. That's why they call it getting high, because you are trying to get to a higher supernatural plane by altering your mind with drugs or whatever. And he says it's also fighting, jealousy, getting angry, selfless ambition, factionalism, all this stuff that divides us. This is normal. And you look, and we'll look in our culture, and you'll look online, and you'll say, well, you know, it's, it's in, only in America where we divide over race and we divide over politics. But if you look at every culture on the planet and throughout time, they divide over race, they divide over class, or like in India, or what they call it a caste system where they're divided. And did anyone see, uh, what's the name of that movie? Crazy Rich Asians. I know I watch way too movies. Um, anyone see that movie? It's, it's, it's about different classes, like super, like, Trump is poor in this movie. He has, like, they're super, like, super, super rich. And some of them look down on the common other people. And I heard one pastor say, if, if we were all the exact same race, right, everyone same color, then we would divide over gender. If we were all the exact same gender, then we would divide over hair color or eye color. And if we all had the same hair color, eye color, same gender, same race, we would divide over length of nose or fingernail. We would find something to divide over because that's, that's humanity. That's just our human nature. That's the way that we work. And he says this. He says, I warn you now, as I've warned you before, those who do such things will have no share in the kingdom of God. So think about it. God's thinking is, hey, I want to spend eternity with humanity, but not like we are now. God doesn't think of it this way. Do you want an eternity where we're divided over race and politics and, and who has more money or wealth or whatever? God says, no, if that's the type of people you are, I don't want to spend eternity with you. And none of us wants an eternity of this. But instead, he says, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, humility, self-control. And he says nothing in the Torah or the law stands against such things. And again, it's not that um, the law, the Old Testament law, people would try to measure up and they couldn't. But the spiritual law, when God puts his spirit in us, just like the law of gravity or the law of, law of motion, you don't have to try to live up to those. It just happens. Same is true of the spiritual law. When God puts his spirit in us, then it's going to bear fruit. Now, granted, just like when you plant fruits, and if you did any planting this year around here, you know, you, instead of starting in the spring, you had to wait till near May because the ground, it was so cold and the ground was so hard. And then a lot of people lost a lot because of all the rain and the flooding. So there are external circumstances that are going to fight against the natural law. But when you plant a seed, it's going to just start to grow. That's just the way it works, just the natural law. And the same is true against the spiritual law. When God puts his Holy Spirit in us, this is the natural thing that happens. Now, we want that fruit. And even though it's like nine characteristics, it's one fruit. Just like an apple tree bears one fruit, an apple, even though there's like hundreds or thousands of apples on the tree, one fruit. But we want those characteristics because we want want to spend an eternity with God. So I want to be more Christ-like in my life, even though it doesn't come out that way all the time. And even though, yes, when God puts his spirit in us, the natural law is that's just going to start happening. The natural spirit in me is going to try to combat that. And so here's the question that we want to ask is, how do we make that happen quicker? How do we expedite that spiritual growth process because, again, left to my own devices, my natural spirit is going to try to combat that, right? And just like um, I, don't, I don't do any gardening, so I don't know, like, the super grow or all those things that you can add. And some of you guys are like, no, those are chemicals. Don't add those or whatever. But there's, there's things that you can do to help expedite the growth process. So we want to, like, jolly green giant this growth process. Anyone remember the Jolly Green Giant? Okay, because I was going to say, if we don't, I weep for our nation. But 
me. Seriously, that's like a, anyway, sidetracked again. But we want a jolly green giant, that growth process, right? So here's what we're going to do. Three things really quickly that we can do today, right now, that are going to help immediately expedite that spiritual growth process. Here's the problem. Most of us, and when I say most of us, I mean all of us, aren't going to be happy with it. Not because they're complex, but just because of what they are. And again, I'm going to put all the verses up here on the screen because uh, we're going to walk through a lot of verses. So this is what Paul tells uh, the church in Colossae. And he says he's writing his letter to them. And this is like the beginning of the letter. I know we have chapters and verse, but this is the way he's beginning. He's starting his letter. And he's heard about like their relationship and their spirit. And he says, from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. So this is Paul. He's telling them he's been there before. And he's like, hey, from the day I heard about what you guys are doing and, and, and how you're on fire for God, he says, we have not stopped praying for you. Every day, this is what we're praying for, that you're filled with the knowledge of God. Right? Makes sense. Here's why he says that. He says, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. He says, ever since we heard about you guys as a church, we're praying for you. We haven't stopped praying for you. We want you to have more knowledge about God so that you walk in a way that's pleasing to God and that you bear fruit, that everything that you do would bear fruit. So this is Paul, and he's saying, hey, I want you guys to know more about God because it's going to increase your spiritual walk. You're going to walk more in the Spirit. You're going to bear more fruit. You're going to be more fruitful, right? Here is the thing. I wish... Now, first of all, everyone take a look around. Just take a look around. And as you can see, um, Gary and I were looking through our, our, our church books, and we were looking at, um, for a selfish reason, because I thought I had been here like the th third longest pastor. Uh, turns out I am second. Yay me. Second longest pastor. Um, and, and when I was doing that, I was also looking through some of the records where, and some of you guys probably before your time, where this beam was the building. That didn't exist. Okay, so you remember, that didn't exist. It was from here, and that was the front where the baptismal is. Somewhere up there stood a pastor, and somewhere from there back to this wall stood two to 300 people. I can't even imagine two to 300 people fitting in all of this, let alone just this. But they did. For months, for years, hundreds of people walked from wherever to come fill this. And today, and I'm not just saying that because all of our band is gone, <laughs> And because, as you can see, this place isn't filled. But because in small churches all over the place, while there are some that may have 40, 50, 100 people, uh, and there are mega churches, praise God for that, where people are flocking in, but the normal response for Christian people is, I don't have time for church today. I'll just watch it online. Even though the church is the place that God has created for people to go and learn more about him, right? And I understand there are lots of things going on in our culture which give the church a bad name, like the whole, you know, report that came out and, and other things. And every time one pastor or one congregation does something wrong, it ripples throughout the Christian community. And people say, that's why I don't want to go to church. And we're talking about this on, on our live stream. But... In general, the church is the place that God created. Hey, I want to create a place where people can come and learn more about me, even though I've revealed everything I want them to know about me in my word, 
I want people to have a place to come and gather and learn. And from the time he created the church in the book of Acts, they would gather not just on Sunday, but regularly and around food. Food and fellowship is throughout the Bible. And the apostles would teach them about the word of God, even to the point where it came to a point where they were like, hey, hey, apostles, there's all these ministries that are going by the wayside. We're trying to feed all these widows over here and these people over here, but there's not enough. And the apostles said, hey, we can't stop teaching. You guys handle that. It is more important that we spend time in prayer and teaching you guys this word. And there's a reason. Because the church is the place where you learn more about the word of God. And when you learn more about the word of God, you learn more about God. You have more knowledge about God. And Paul said, hey, guess what? We want you to have more knowledge about God because then you'll have a better spiritual walk and you'll bear fruit in everything that you do. And so, like I said, most people don't like this when you tell them, yeah, if you want to increase your spiritual walk, you got to learn more about God. Now, those of you who have watched this live stream that we do, right, this is literally pastors, not just from one church, from several churches who just sit and answer questions about God. That's all we do. We sit and we'll live stream. People comment and ask questions, and we'll say, yeah, well, here's what the Word of God says about this topic, whether it be heaven and hell or, you know, how to deal with people who hurt you or forgiveness or all this stuff. That's the only reason we do it. We're not paid to do it, and I checked because I thought I was the only one not getting paid, but none of us are paid to do it. We're not paid to do it. We just do it because we want people to know more about God. And sometimes in a session like this, you don't have the opportunity to say, hey, what about, what about, what about? So we created an opportunity like this. Uh, and where it says coffee with pastors coming soon, that's where not even just live stream, we're going to sit in a coffee shop, a bunch of pastors, whoever shows up, just talk to people about God, people who have questions, people, well, I've heard the Bible, you know, says this, but I'm not sure about that, or what about this, or what about that? Food and Fellowship throughout the Bible is answering questions so that people can increase their knowledge about God, right? Because that's what Paul says. He says, hey, increase your knowledge about God. That's going to increase your spiritual growth. It's going to expedite that growth process of God's Holy Spirit working in you. Now, here's the next one. Uh, Paul writes to the church in Philippi, and he says this in chapter 3. He says, brethren, together follow my example and observe those who live after the pattern that we have set for you. So he says, hey, I want you guys to do what I do Right? And we've set a pattern of living for you. This is how you should live. This is how you should live out your spiritual walk. You see other people doing that. That's what you should do. And he tells them why. Because he says, there are many of whom I have often told you and now tell you even with tears who walk and live as enemies of the cross of Christ, the anointed one. He says, hey, I want you to do what I do because there are other people who claim to be Christians who are not living and walking in a Christian way, don't follow them. And again, this is why you end up with, uh, whether it be some congregations or some pastors or some people that say, yes, we're a Christ follower, but this part of the Bible we're going to ignore, or I'm going to go do this, and even though the Bible says I shouldn't, it's okay, and they're not living in a way that's in accordance with God's word. And so Paul says, hey, if you really want to grow, then you've got to follow someone. And it doesn't have to be just a pastor. If, if you work in an office, if you work in a school, if you're going to school, find someone who is a Christ follower and like, hey, you're in this secular environment just like me. How are you maintaining your relationship with God? And then follow them. But here's the thing. It's not just follow them. Uh, find a mentor, but also be willing to mentor others. Because if you're in that environment, and you're the Christ follower, and you're doing your job in a God-honoring way, be willing to spend some time with others to say, hey, I know we're in a, 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 you know, a workplace that doesn't allow you to read, that doesn't allow you to pray, that doesn't allow you, and you may feel like, how am I going to keep up my Christian walk? Here's what I do. Be willing to spend that time and teach others and share others and equip others. So increased knowledge of God, finding a mentor, mentoring others, those are going to expedite your spiritual walk. And here is the last one, uh, and this is what Jesus says. So you can debate and argue with me on the others. This one, 
Jesus says it's non-negotiable, right? And this is the message version. Uh, he says, and he's talking to his disciples, this is right before he leaves, right? He's, this is his last, we need to have an in-depth conversation. We need to have a board meeting. He's sharing with his disciples before he knows he's going to the cross. He says, I am the real vine, and my father, God, is the farmer. And he's going to uh, make some um, uh, uh, analogies, but he's giving them beforehand, and he'll come back and clarify it after who's who in these analogies. He says, I'm the real vine. My father is the farmer. He, my father, cuts off every branch of me that doesn't bear grapes. And every branch that is grape-bearing, he prunes back so it will bear even more. Now, in a lot of versions, it says fruit. But this is the message version, and it's kind of like a paraphrase, and they're using grape vines, so they're saying it must be grapes, but bear fruit. And this is what Jesus says. He says, he, my father, he's the farmer, right? He cuts off every branch that doesn't bear grapes or that doesn't bear fruit. So he's saying, not me, don't argue with me, he's saying that God comes along and says, hey, you're not bearing fruit? I'm sorry, but I don't need you. Because remember, God doesn't want to spend eternity with a bunch of people who are divisive and angry and, and selfish. That's not what he wants. So if you're not bearing fruit, spiritual fruit, then your human nature is what's dominant. God says, I don't really want to spend eternity with that. And Jesus says he cuts it off. But every branch that is grape-bearing or that does bear fruit, he prunes back so it will bear even more. So if you are bearing fruit, if, you're, if you are growing in love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and self-control, then God steps in and says, hey, you're growing. Let me tweak a little bit here, cut a little bit here, so that you grow even more, so that you grow even quicker. And this is what he says. He says, you are already pruned back by the message I have spoken. And a lot of people misunderstand this, but what Jesus is saying is, hey, when you hear my words, some of the words of Jesus are pretty hard they cut to the core. Some of the words are, of Jesus are pretty inspiring, but all of the words of Jesus are going to help us grow spiritually, which goes back to number one, going to places where you can learn more about the word of God and learn more about God. But he says just hearing his word, that's going to prune, that's going to uh, create an opportunity for spiritual growth. But then he says this, he says, live in me, make your home in me, just as I do in you, in the same way that a branch can't bear grapes by itself, but only by being joined to the vine. You can't bear fruit unless you're joined with me. So whether you agree on, you know, coming to church or going to Bible studies or Sunday school or, or spending time, you know, learning about God, whether you disagree with me on whether or not that's going to bear spiritual growth, whether you disagree with me about finding a mentor in your workplace or home or school, someone who you can model after, like Paul said, do what I do, whether you disagree with me about that, Jesus makes this non-negotiable. He says, you can't bear fruit unless you are joined with him, unless you're spending time with him, unless he says you live in him, you make him your home. Now, I don't know about you, but... Um, Normally, after working or tired, or like yesterday, came down here, had to do a lot of work, got back home, forget what time it was, but I showered, then put back on pajamas. Just wanted to veg at home and relax. And for most of us, home is a place where we feel safe, where we feel comfortable, where uh, ladies, and don't throw anything at me, where you may feel like I don't have to get up, put on a bunch of makeup and do my hair, you know, fellas, where you feel like, you know what, I can walk around in my underwear or my bare socks or do whatever, and if you do do that, don't share it with us, but it's the place where you feel comfortable and safe, and you can relax, and you can be yourself, and that's what Jesus is supposed to be for us, that place where we look forward to coming to and spending time in and relaxing in and getting energized before I have to go out and do it all again and again and again. And if this isn't really clear, I love it when he reiterates because he says again, I am the vine, you are the branches, that's us. When you're joined with me and I with you, the relation, intimate 
and organic, the harvest is sure to be abundant. When we spend time with Jesus, whether it be through prayer or through reading his word, it doesn't have to be in church, when you're sitting at home and you're just reading through his word, we said this before, one of the beauties of the Bible is you don't have to take my word for it, you get to ask the author, God, what did you mean by this? How am I supposed to apply this to my life? And he says when we do that and we have this intimate, organic relationship, there's going to be a harvest. But here's the harsh part, he says, separated when we're not connected to him, we're not spending time with him, you can't produce a thing. You're not going to grow spiritually. And you're going to be that one that instead of pruning back so you continue to grow little by little, that God as the farmer comes along and says, hey, this isn't growing. I'm just going to cut this off. So here's what I'm going to ask us to do. We're going to spend a little bit of time in prayer. I'm going to ask you to bow your head. God, we know, we realize that uh, we all come from different backgrounds, different spiritual backgrounds, maybe no spiritual background, different places, different life experiences. But your goal, your priority for all of us is that we would step across the line of faith, accept the sacrifice of your son, Jesus Christ, not so that we could spend the rest of our life trying to live up to a set of rules, but so that we would be able to spend eternity with you. And we desire to be a people that are growing more and more like you. We realize that some of us may be growing faster because we've had households or homes where your word was taught and where we were taken to church. Some of us may have been growing a little bit slower because we're just trying to grasp what it means to be a Christ follower. But all of us desire to experience your love, your goodness, your grace, and your mercy. Everyone desires to be a better person. And that's what your spirit makes them. So we pray first and foremost, if we're here and depending upon where we are in our spiritual journey, if we've never heard your word or never experienced your love, that right now there's not a prayer that we have to say, there's not a, a quote that we have to make. We just have to be willing to receive your love. If we haven't done that before, we pray that we receive it right now. The love made possible, that intimate, organic relationship made possible by the sacrifice of your son, Jesus Christ. God, maybe if we have received it, but we are feeling stunted in our spiritual growth, we pray that you would help us find those opportunities where we can make more time, whether it be through Bible study, whether it be through reading Bible apps, whether it be through coming to the Sunday celebration, where we learn more about your goodness and grace and mercy, and we begin to get filled with the knowledge of you. We pray that you would create more opportunities for us to do that. We pray that you would lead us to uh, God-honoring friends or co-workers in our workplaces, in our schools, with whom we can share, with whom we can be mentored by, with whom we can mentor if they need it. We pray that you would make a way for us, more than anything, to spend more time with you, to dwell in you, to be connected to the vine. Because as your word says, separated from you, we can pray that you would create those opportunities. We pray that you would open our ears and our hearts and our minds and our eyes to see those opportunities. And we pray that we would grow spiritually into the God-honoring people that you are calling us to be, that we might share and show the love of Christ to the people in our circles of influence. We pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Thank you, guys. I pray that you have an awesome rest of your Sunday. Uh, God bless and see you.
see you next week, hopefully with a praise team. So pray for them as well. God bless.